our agency. The news is full of organizations, both civilian, military, and government, civilian sector, as I mentioned, that have suffered problems from ethical lapses in their conduct of their operations. Today, we're fortunate to have a couple of presenters to here to discuss with us about this and why this might happen and why it does occur in organizations that profess to have organizational ethics and a code of ethics uh, as far as um, how they operate, and that yet they still suffer from these challenges. Ted Thomas, PhD, Lieutenant Colonel, retired from the Director of Department of Command and Leadership uh, here at the Staff College. Uh, Dr. Thomas graduated from the United States Military Academy and served over 20 years in command and staff positions in the Army, um, highlighted by serving as a battalion commander of the 554th Engineer Battalion. He holds a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois and a PhD in engineering management from Missouri University of Science and Technology. He's been with the CGSC faculty since 2005 and has been the director of the department since 2007. His co-presenter is Chaplain Jonathan Bailey, who's currently serving on the faculty here, has been here, this is his first year on the faculty, so welcome. Um, he is the ethics instructor for the college. Uh, he took his bachelor's degree from Stetson University, and he holds a couple of master's degrees from Boston School of Theology, Boston University School of Theology. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome two experts in the field of organizational ethics, Dr. Thomas, Chaplain Bailey. Thank you. I apologize for not getting Chaplain Bailey's uh, name on there, but uh, I started writing a paper oh, last year. I, I started looking at uh, ethics issues. And, you know, you, you see a lot of people in the newspaper, and it's normally just an individual that's done something stupid uh, and gets fired. And, and, but I started looking at how about organizations? What about organizations that, that have problems? And, and Fat Leonard was... Uh, with the Seventh Fleet was kind of in the news, and that kind of got me thinking about how do organizations kind of go bad. And so that's why I, I have the, the title, Organization Ethics Gone Bad, because sometimes the whole organizations kind of drift away. And, and it kind of goes back to uh, why does that happen? So I looked at Hitler, and, and you know, you, you might think Hitler was a bad apple, right? And he took Nazi Germany down, down a, a bad path. Well, there was also the Treaty of Versailles that kind of set up the, uh, the bad barrel that was just creating an environment for something bad to happen. So, so the question is, is it a bad barrel or a bad apple that, that causes the unethical behavior? And so as I look at this, I look at organizations. So you have it, like in the Army, you've had uh, the Black Hearts, where you had a platoon kind of go rogue and, and do some nasty things, or, or Haditha with the Marine platoon that did some, some nasty things. So you have it in the military, but you also have it in the, in the civilian world. So my, my real question was, was at the organizational level, why do these things happen? And when I started first thinking about this, it was Seventh Fleet that got me interested in it. And Fat Leonard is... Uh, is, is basically, he was uh, the head of, uh, is Leonard Glenn, the head of Glenn Defense Ministry, uh, Marine uh, Asia, and he basically outfitted the whole 7th Fleet in the, in the Pacific Theater. He was there for 20-some-odd uh, years. They started uh, looking back about a decade ago at, at some of his illegal, immoral, unethical practices. He used bribes. He used paid for vacations. He used prostitutes. He used all sorts of things to get uh, information from the government on where the, well, from the Navy particularly, on where their ships were going to berth, and this is secret information, and he was able to get access to information that uh, the Chinese weren't able to get access to. And how did he do that? How did he, how did he infiltrate into the Navy to get access to this? And so it was just kind of inf interesting to me that there's a culture there, and that, that culture goes, I think, a little bit beyond just Fat Leonard, because if you look at at all the issues that have been in the news with the Navy, it's usually been Seventh Fleet ships bumping into other ships and getting people killed, or a drug prostitution ring in Japan off of Seventh Fleet soldiers. So I think there's something bigger than just Fat Leonard going on there. So I, I want to take a look at, at what causes organizations to kind of drift from their espoused values to, to doing immoral, illegal, unethical things. And so that's kind of where, where uh, we pick up from here. So, Chaplain? Well, and so we looked at some other organizations, other companies, uh, for instance, Volkswagen, and with their TDI, their tricky diesels, 
uh, right? Because they were engineered to perform a certain way on specific tests. And then in practice, once the test was over, they were designed to switch over so that they would be more functional for people driving them. Uh, ergo, people thinking that they're buying a car to help the environment are really buying a car that's doing the same thing that they've done prior to that. Uh, and so, Vioxx. Uh, Merix designed Vioxx and was running through their test period and came across some anomalies in reference to cardiovascular conditions. And so there was a few different schools of thought. Should they pull it? Now what's going on simultaneously is they're in a battle with Celebrex, right? And so how do they get this drug to market and beat their competitor? And if you're going to be strapped with having to run through additional testing that may or may not be, uh, that may or may not cause you to pull your product off the shelf, uh, people don't necessarily want to do unneeded tests. Now, unneeded, when you're talking about potentially causing cardiovascular issues, heart attacks, and other subsequent conditions, that's a pretty big deal. And so the American people didn't take too kindly to this. Um, the Ford Pinto. So Ford, knowing that the Pinto has problems uh, and is potentially an explosive automobile, chose to rather pay out for you know, cars that blew up rather than recall because it would have cost them more money to recall the vehicle. Uh, Enron, Arthur Anderson, who remembers the story of what happened to Enron? I mean, they're auditing company, for crying out loud. The people who are supposed to keep them financially accountable are shredding documents to keep people out of trouble. So these are, and then Wells Fargo, when we incentivize people to do unethical, illegal things, and we get that from our employees and then reward them for this behavior, uh, it can lead us down a path where we never intended to go because you incentivize the wrong things. Next slide, please. So the Milgram experiment. Again, going back to Nazi Germany and thinking about, you know, a lot of people were involved in the systematic abuse and death of millions of people. How, how can a society get there? Well, Milgram uh, did an experiment where he took normal people off the street and he had colleagues that he was working with who the colleagues, unbeknownst to the volunteers, had were going to be the students for this test period. Uh, but the volunteers thought that they were just randomly selected to be students and teachers. And now the volunteers, the people off the street, were told, okay, you're the teacher. If, this, if the student doesn't answer the, the question correctly, you, you shock them. And so as they go along, the two-thirds of the participants, of the volunteers, shocking the student end up at a level where the student would have died from the shock received. So Milgram proves that you can take decent people off the street, put them in an authoritative role, tell them, give them rules, lay down the law, and this is what you're going to do. And it's relatively easy to get people to follow the rules, to, I was just following orders. Sir, this is a next slide. So uh, there's a, another experiment done in the, in the 70s, and it's uh, called the Stanford Prison Experiment. How many of you are familiar with the Stanford Prison Experiment? So I, I actually got to, to listen to Phil Zimbardo give a talk, and he's the guy that kind of ran the Stanford uh, Prison Experiment. What he did was he asked for volunteers. He just got a bunch of volunteers, and he decided he was going to create this little prison in, in, an old, uh, in a dormitory uh, at Stanford. Uh, so he created the, uh, uh, basically a prison in the bottom basement, and he lined these folks up and basically said, okay, you're a guard, you're a prisoner, you're a guard, you're a prisoner. So it was totally random. And, uh, and so he put them in there, and, and they started acting like guards and prisoners. And, and uh, the guards started doing really sophomore kind of things. And, and uh, you, you know, 
what he did was, was he made sure that, that the guards were anonymous by putting sunglasses on them so that they were kind of like behind, you couldn't see their eyes. They numbered the prisoners, took, put them in, in like, uh, I don't know, sheets. and put it, They just started doing some really nasty things to him. And uh, it was supposed to be a two-week experiment. And Dr. Zimbardo at the time was engaged, and he thought, hey, this is a pretty neat experiment. I'm going to bring my fiancé over to, to take a look at this. So he brought his, his, his soon-to-be wife over to take a look at this experiment, and she looked at what was going on and said, I don't want to marry anybody that would put up with this. So you better stop this right now, or it is off. <laughs> we are not getting married because this is horrific. And, and he took a step back because he had been so involved as a scientist trying to figure out, okay, why are they doing what they're doing and, and taking notes and figuring all this stuff out that he got so involved in the detail, he lost sight of the ethics that were involved. And it wasn't until his fiance came in and said, hey, this is disgusting. Stop it now or else. And he called, a, called the experiment off after about six days out of the, the two weeks and, uh, and ended up getting married. So we, uh, <laughs> we, we end up kind of taking from here on the Stanford Prison Experiment to, to basically looking at uh, a real-life experiment at Abu Ghraib. Now, out of the room, I'm sure that almost everyone's familiar with this scenario. Um, but the Abu Ghraib prison run by the United States Army uh, in Iraq, you had the command set a climate where uh, the prisoners were dehumanized and the guards were allowed to do things to these prisoners that were unconscionable. Uh, so much so that even the chaplain that was with the organization uh, who was running this particular prison uh, was not allowed into the prison to talk to the guards, to talk to leaders inside the prison. Uh, in fact, she was told to just stay out. Um, and so if you have to keep people who are supposed to keep you accountable out of a, out of a facility, uh, something's going on that shouldn't be going on. Uh, if the people who are there to provide some level of oversight and, you know, who are, who are specifically there to take care of you and your service members and make sure that we're staying above board, if we're intentionally taking steps to prevent that from happening, why? What's going on there that I know is going on that I don't want someone else to see or to be aware of? And so the treatment of these particular prisoners, I mean... Pictures of men naked, huddling together, uh, beaten. Uh, things that Philip Zimbardo said, you know, well, yes, clearly anybody in this environment would have done that, but we had other prisons where they didn't do that. So what was the difference? Uh, I think you've got to look at leadership, and you have to also look at service members and what was being tolerated from, you know, subordinates to, you know, the commanding officer. And there were, because there were other prisons where this wasn't done. So what was different here? And so, because again, it goes back to bad barrel, bad apple, and they both sort of coincide here. Um, so, next slide. So Phil, Phil Zimbardo actually testified at the trial for a lot of the Abu Ghraib folks and talked about it being a bad barrel that anybody would have to, and used that as a defense to, to try and get them off. It, it didn't work, but, but at any rate, he, uh, he used his, his experience on the Stanford prison experiment to, uh, to do that. So at any rate, so we started looking at why do organizations behave unethically? And we came up with five different theories. And so we're going to go through each one of those theories uh, in a little bit more detail. But these are the five theories. Moral disengagement, ethical fading, craft ethics, administrative evil, and bounded ethicality. So, so moral disengagement uh, is pretty much a, a group construct. So if everyone's responsible, then it limits how much personal responsibility I have 
Because we're all responsible. We were all in on it together. Uh, and then this, this, this goes into a kind of a group, group think mentality when we're talking about a dehumanized other, where you have a class of people that are othered by a particular class of people. So, I mean, within history we can see numerous examples, even within our own country. Think slavery. How does a system of slavery happen when the Constitution states, specifically, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, right? But then you go down this process of dehumanization, and all of a sudden, well, they're not human. So how often that goes throughout history, even, again, Hitler, Nazi Germany. Well, they're not really human. They're Jews, right? I mean, the dissonance that we hear in those kind of statements. And euphemisms, the, the constructions of... Uh, so the, the picture on the side, one man's collateral damage is another man's son or daughter or wife, husband, right? I mean... We, we, we want to minimize what's actually going on to ease our conscience. And so when we can do that in a broad group of people, it's even easier to buy into, well, yeah, I know we did some pretty bad things, but clearly we're not all wrong. I mean, you know, there's so many people doing it. And so we minimize that level of personal responsibility and try to soothe our conscience in the process. As we go through these, there's some overlap between them, but they're looking at, at unethical behavior through a different lens. So this one in, in uh, ethical fading, it's really a form of self-deception. For those of you that, that don't know, this is the Challenger uh, astronauts. And uh, I don't know if some of you may have seen a little reenactment of it where they're, they have a, a discussion between NASA and Morton Thiokol. And, and and basically, Morton Thiokol is saying, hey, it's too cold, we don't want to launch. And, and NASA is saying, what, we've canceled this how many times? And, and you're telling us at the last minute, because it's cold, you don't want to launch? You know, where's the data? What's the scientific data on says that you don't want to launch? So, so Morton Thiokol call, calls a halt to the, the discussions with, with NASA so they can talk among themselves. And one of the senior managers says to another guy that was voting against launching the, the Challenger, he said, okay, Bob, I want you to take off your engineering hat, and I want you to put on your management hat. And that's really what ethical fading is, is doing. It's, it's saying, hey, let's, take a look at, let, let's not take a look at this from an ethical perspective. Let's take a look at it from a business or money perspective or, or a legal perspective or make it an economic decision instead of an ethical decision. And all of a sudden, the, the ethical decision starts to fade into the background, and the other decisions kind of come to the front. So that's what ethical fading talks about. There's also an issue with, with just when you normalize routines that are, that are not good routines, then it, it suddenly becomes not so much an ethical decision anymore. It starts to fade into the background. And, and that's the, the ethical fading piece. I would say a look, take a look at uh, Ford Pinto. You know, theirs was a business decision. It was like it's cheaper to pay off the, the insurance claims and, and for people that we killed than it is to recall all these ve vehicles. So that ethical decision faded and, and became a business decision. So do people do this? Y yeah, they have done it, and they'll probably do it again. But I think understanding the, the dynamics and the thinking behind it hopefully will keep the ethical piece up front. To craft ethics or ethical relativism, uh, that we define our ethical stance by our ability to accomplish the mission. So, in a sense, where it, it's akin to utilitarian ethics. So, what fits the situation? Um, and then there's there's clearly divergences between the person I am at home. And then the person I am at work, and we sort of divorce ourselves from those two people, trying to compartmentalize uh, our ethical frameworks. And so we, we look at Milai, and, you know, how is it possible for people who would not kill indiscriminately, I mean, and we're taught as service members not to kill indiscriminately, but then 
you go to Vietnam and you go to this village and now everyone there is a status-based combatant. Just because you're in this area, you are deemed a combatant rather than a performance-based combatant where, you know, you need to be engaged in some type of illicit enemy activity, uh, either attacking, doing something that marks you as a service member that we oppose or an enemy force. And so we create sort of this binary where, okay, this is who I am at work. This is how things work in our office. This is how things work in the field. And, you know, when we're at home and other people are watching, this is how we conduct ourselves. If that makes sense. So I think, you know, just uh, we've got Me Lai up there. Uh, just it, it was it was covered up. Hugh Thompson from Me Lai. It was mm -hmm. covered up for a year. Uh, it, nobody spoke about it until finally some guy heard about it and started doing some investigation and brought it forward. But I mean, Hugh Thompson was there saying, "Hey, if you, you fire on these people, we will, I will, I will kill you." Uh, so his craft ethics was not the same as what the other folks that were were there. Um, administrative evil. I think the the administrative evil piece kind of overflows in, in, a, in a several different of the several different areas. Uh, this one is basically talking about all of us having a little bit of a taint uh, for being responsible for doing bad things. So in one way or another, so, so let me use the Holocaust as an example. So in the Holocaust, you, you've got the Nazis uh, rounding up Jews, putting them on cattle trains, sending them off to concentration camps, uh, and, and systematically murdering like nine million people or however many it was. In, in that process, you've got train engineers, right? They, they didn't directly do anything, but they made sure that the trains ran on time and, and got to where they were supposed to go. They, there were clerks. There was medical people. There was people, you know, logging folks in. There was like gobs and gobs of people that were making these things happen that could say, you know, it's not me. Don't point the finger at me. But the administrative evil piece says that, hey, they all had a piece in this. They all are a little tainted by helping this and not, not taking a stand and not stopping and not, not uh, moving away from it. So when I look at, at uh, some examples closer to home, I, I think the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry kills lots of folks. If, if anybody smokes or dips, I'm sorry. You should stop. It's, <laughs> it's bad for you. Uh, and <laughs> but those that are, take part of the industry, are they then taking part of helping kill hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people? Are they part of that administrative evil? I look at uh, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. Started in 1932, 600 black men had syphilis. They were told, hey, we're going to give you free medical care. And what they did was they made sure they were not treated for the syphilis. And they studied them. Now, I mean, th this it sounds so unethical. You just can't believe how somebody would do this. But this happened from 1932 and didn't stop until 1972, long after a cure for syphilis was found. So why was this still going on? Why was this such an unethical thing still going on? Well, you, you've got people that are just doing their job. You know, I'm just a clerk logging this stuff in. It's not my job to do any, to, you know. So, so the administrative people kind of stood back and say, hey, I'm just following orders. I'm just doing my job. I'm not, I'm not part of this ethical issue kind of thing. I, I'm, just, I'm just here, you know, doing what I'm supposed to do. So I would say that, that if you look around in society, uh, there's lots of unethical things going on. And we, we should take a look at what our part is that, in that. And, and I would say that each of us is probably tainted a little ways in some unethical things in our society. That would be the administrative evil part. Well, and that, that correlates to what uh, Max Bazerman and others have called bounded ethicality. So my desire to be an ethical person means that I often overlook things that I do which are unethical and simply call them ethical. Um, because we have a framework, right? We have people who are responsible for keeping us within, you know, certain ethical practices. We have auditors. We have investigators. We have the IG. 
Uh, and so we've got all these systems in place. But then if you notice the, the cartoon on the side, you have, you know, the bishop talking to another bishop about the Joe Pa situation when he was fired from Penn State, you know, after the Sandusky incident broke. Well, for, for years, this had been going on and had been reported several times to include the time when, a, when an assistant coach walked into a bathroom and saw Coach Sandusky sodomizing a young boy in the Penn State showers, and it never left the school. It went to the president's office, but it never went beyond the school. No one ever called the police. And so, you know, and then the church's response is, well, why didn't they just move him? Right? Because that's what the Catholic Church did. And so, in The Power of Noticing, Bazerman talks specifically about the Cardinal Law incident in Massachusetts where they had several priests who were just simply moved out of churches into other areas, into other parishes. And how long did that go on? But yet, we, we, because we're vested and we're invested in these organizations, then we can be blinded to the fact that we're incentivized to get to a yes, to support the organization and it blinds us to our own unethical behavior in supporting the organization that we love. Maybe this is causing me to do something that I ought not or shouldn't or wouldn't do otherwise. But because I'm invested, because I want us to get there, because I want the outcome that we desire, then I'm quick to not think that what I'm doing is, is unethical or what we're doing as a group is unethical. You know, I, I, I look at some of the, the case studies that we use in, in leadership. One of them is tailhook. And uh, it, from a person from the outside looking in at the tailhook piece back years ago, it's like, that's reprehensible. Why would anybody do that? But when you're in the organization and you've grown up that way, it become, you become blind to the ethical piece to it. Yes. And so it's ethical blindness because, you know, as a... As, as a second lieutenant and you see something that's wrong but everybody else is accepting it and it's doing it, then, then, you, then you tend to agree with it. And then by the time you're a major, you tend to be the one that's doing it, you know, that's running it. And so by the time you're a general, you, you've taken advantage. I mean, you, you've, you've, this has just been part of how the organization runs for like 20, 30 years. And so you're blind to the ethical piece behind this. And so oftentimes, you know, it's, there's an unconscious blindness because you've been raised in that type of environment and you just don't see it. Uh, there's also a motivated blindness in that maybe if uh, you lose your job if you, if you speak up. And, and so you become blind because there's a self-interest piece and, and it becomes almost sub unconscious in that, uh, in that you allow these things to keep going. And I look at my own, my own upbringing, you know, like... Uh, you know, prop lasts in the 82nd. Those probably got way out of hand. And uh, if you, <laughs> I know, it's shocking. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it, that's just the way you grew up, and that's just what you expect. And so you didn't think anything about stopping it. Um, Arthur Anderson, you know, talk about motivated blindness. They were getting paid to, to look at Enron's books, and if Enron's books weren't good, they were going to go to another organization to, to audit them and pay somebody else millions and millions of dollars. So they had a, a motivated blindness also to, to turn the other, uh, other eye. So the question becomes, what's a person to do? And, and there's really five, five choices that you have to make. And when I take a look at these choices, I, I want to go back to the Fat Leonard scandal because there was actually an officer in the Navy that uh, went through three of these choices. The, the first choice was to report it to the chain of command. So he's looking at this bribery scandal stuff going on, and he reports it to the chain of command. And, and the chain of command's like, nah, we're not doing anything with this. Why? Because <laughs> maybe I'm the one taking the bribes. Or even if I'm not the one taking the bribes, it's been going on for 10, 20 years, so I don't think it's any, any big deal. It's like, oh, that's just how we operate. That's how we do things here. That's how we roll here, right? So, so he reported up to chain of command, nothing happened. So then he thought, all right, Nothing's going on there. Let me go to NCIS. I'm going to go report to NCIS. Everybody watch the show NCIS, right? Uh, so he reports to NCIS. Well, what happens when it gets to NCIS? 
Fat Leonard has a mole in NCIS that's on his payroll, and he gets this report and shreds it and throws it away. So nothing happens. So he reported inside the chain of command, he went outside the chain of command, and then he decided, I don't want to be part of a corrupt organization. And so that's number five. He just left. He said, I'm out of the Navy. Bye-bye, Navy. So the other two choices are basically to say, well, I'm just going to be ethically neutral, and I'm just going to turn, turn the other way and just say, I'm not part of this. Uh, but boys will be boys, let them do whatever, and, and I'm going to step back and step away from it. Now, you take a look at different things like Me Lai. There were people that didn't partake in Me Lai. Uh, if you look at the, the Sassman piece where they threw, threw a couple guys off the bridge, there was one of the soldiers that said, hey, I'm not going to be part of this, and separated himself. So there's folks that just say, hey, I, I'm not going to be a part of this, but I'm going to be ethically neutral. So I, I'm not going to have that ethical stink on me, but I'm not going to report you. And why don't they report? Well, because if you, if you look at what happens to whistleblowers, oftentimes uh, they get a Let me just use one example as a whistleblower. Abu Ghraib, uh, Sergeant Darby, what happened to him when he blew the whistle on Abu Ghraib? He had to be in protective custody for a year, right? A year. Because they were afraid that somebody would kill him or harm him for a year for doing the right thing. When he went home, his father said, hey, you know, what you did was bad. You know, I'm, I'm not sure you're my son anymore. So his father rejected him. His town rejected him. Why? Because he did the right thing. So whistleblowers, it takes some courage to, to stand up and, and report within and outside the, the chain of command. Uh, most people, just if they're not going to partake of it, like the two-thirds that are in the Milgram's experiment that are going to partake of it, if you're not going to be a part of that, you, you just kind of ignore it and say, I'm not a part of it. Or the other piece is you just join right in and become part of the unethical uh, activities, which is what a lot of folks do. So five things that uh, a per five choices a person can make. So now we've, we looked at how do you fix it? So, so I, I kind of have a so, kind of so, a way to fix it. Well, so, so we've taken we've we've historically done these three things that are up there. We, we either fire the leadership, we fire the individual, or we uh, just make more training and policy guidance. We, we had a 350-1 requirement. Yeah. Yes. So, so how many of you guys have seen the Secretary of Defense memo uh, leading with an ethical mindset? Uh, has anybody seen that memorandum yet? Okay, so we at least have one. Uh, so in this, in this memo, the new Secretary of Defense describes that we are going to lead with an ethical mindset and says that we are a commitment-based a commitment organization, not a compliance-based organization. However, at the bottom of the memorandum, it tells us that by November 31st of, uh, of this year, that all units will have done ethical training. So uh, if that doesn't get to we, in fact, are a compliance-based organization and not a commitment-based organization. I don't know what will. <laughs> so if you just take a look at Seventh Fleet, you know, they're firing the leadership, they're firing people, and, uh, and they're putting new requirements on. So they're trying to do all three of these things to, to address the issues. So we, we wanted to try and get a little bit deeper level and say, what are, what are some organizational solutions? So we came up with, with four. So... The first is recognize the propensity for unethical behavior. Now, part of the crucial process in this is establishing relationships with people outside of our organizations. Um, that can be really challenging when you are in a field where you deal with sensitive classified information. But there are, there are DOD civilians, there are interagency partners that we have that are not necessarily a part of our organization, but have security clearances that are appropriate to be able to look at, are the processes really ethical? Is what I'm doing actually ethical? But we've got to take time to build those relationships and cultivate honest relationships with people outside my own organization. It's not enough to simply say, I've got these subordinates that I trust, I've got this mentor that I trust, and we're all invested in the same organization, and so we're going to be motivated, motivatedly blind 
to certain left and right issues where, okay, we're not going to look at that because we've established that that's unethical and I'm not going to look at that because it's unethical. So we're only going to focus on the areas where I know that we're straight on or at least we can make minor adjustments and fix ourselves because it's not really about fixing ourselves, it's about the appearance of ethicality or being ethical. So that's a lot of times when we're talking about you know, the treatment to motivated blindness, what we're doing is we're creating processes that make us look more ethical without actually changing the foundational realities that make us unethical. Uh, the decisions that we make aren't necessarily altered by the, process that's, by the processes that we then put in place. Uh, so until we have sufficient buy-in from these outside entities that are looking in with an unmotivated lens that are saying, no, that, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, you need to fix this. Because it, so until we cultivate those kind of relationships that can meaningfully inform us, then it's hard to get beyond that motivated blindness. Also, maintaining internal and external checks, which kind of goes into that. Uh, this is where we can look at some of the processes that we already have internal. Uh, reporting processes, things like that, that we'll get into. Uh, but where we can look at, hey, how are we structured to deal with some of these things internally? Uh, you know, promotion systems, incentives. You know, how do we incentivize certain behaviors that we want to see, that we want, to, that we want our subordinates and that we want our leaders to foster. How do we incentivize those things? And then how do we build checks internally and externally into those systems? Sir? So I, I think uh, the third thing we were looking at is, is fostering ethical leadership. And, I, and I'd also add, and followership. I mean, really, that's the, it, it's got to be from both, the, the leaders and the followers. And so, so how do you do that? Well, you need to be able to fire people that are not ethical uh, and not just move them around and, and expect them to suddenly become ethical. You need to hire the right folks so that you, if you have a question on hiring somebody that you think is not ethical, then maybe that's not the right person to, to hire. You need to have the, the rewards and punishments set up to, to reward ethical behavior and punish unethical behavior. Um, and, and you have to look at your unintended consequences for, for the rewards because oftentimes, so I get Wells Fargo, you know, you rewarded people for more accounts, right? So they created fake accounts. So, so you have to really be on top of what it is you're incentivizing your folks to do to see if it's causing unethical behavior. And, and if it is, then find a different incentive because that's not, what you, that's not the purpose of that incentive. Even though it's, it's supposedly bringing in more, more money, it's, it's really costing in the long term. Uh, the other thing you need to do is to encourage dissent. So there has to be a way where voices of dissent can be heard. And you know, if you're good at it with an open door policy, that's great, but if, if people have an open door policy and you come into dissent and you get yelled at and kicked out, then, then it's probably not gonna <laughs> work the way you want to. So you may have to have like an anonymous uh, way of, of reporting uh, and, and of dissenting. But there has to be a way within the organization so, so that you can have, hear voices of dissent. Uh, codes of conduct need to be enforced. They ought to be well written. Uh, the, the fourth thing we took, the, took a look at is adopting processes to foster ethical decisions. And in, in that one, I would say that you know, a red teaming uh, might be a good way to, to take a look at, at this, where you, where you set up a team to, to look at the, the opposite of, of what you're trying to accomplish or, or to, to, to tear down uh, what you're doing so, so you have a different opposing viewpoint. So you kind of have a... Uh, a devil's advocate kind of, and I mean, that's probably not the right term to use in, a, in an ethics uh, in, environment, but, but you know what I mean. So you got somebody getting a, a different look at, at what you're trying to do uh, in fostering that, that ethical environment. Um, the other thing would just be to protect whistleblowers. You know, when, when it's all said and done, uh, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a bad barrel or a bad apple. You have to prepare for both. You have to prepare whether it's a bad barrel, bad, bad apple, and you have to address both, whether it becomes a bad barrel or a bad apple. And, and a lot of that is, is on the leadership to, to make sure you fix and correct, but it's also on the followers, uh, because if, you know, if people stop following, then, then the leaders are gonna take notice and you're gonna have to do something to correct it as well. But I think this is a, you know, eth unethical behavior 
it's an individual problem, uh, but it can become an organizational problem. And so if it's an organizational problem, then certainly the, the leadership in the organization needs to be aware and be looking on the lookout for it and stop it before it gets out of hand and you don't end up with a, a seventh fleet and 20 plus admirals and 400 people being indicted uh, for something that's been going on for, for years and years. So with that, I think uh, we, we're about ready to, to open it up for questions. So it, if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to uh, answer them. If they're hard ones, I'll give them to Chaplain Bailey. If they're easy <laughs> ones, I'll take them. Where do you draw the Venn diagram between morality and ethics? Because you can have immoral people that behave ethically. So is that, I, I, I've always kind of struggled with that in my head. Is there, or are, there, are they two separate things? I, I think uh, I'll defer to the, uh, the ethics chaplain <laughs> who has a master's degree in, in, okay. in that. So, so I like the way that, uh, at least one of my professors describes this, is that we have moral traditions, uh, largely faith systems, community beliefs, uh, you know, ways that we approach the world that we were, that were engendered in us very early on. And so, you know, my sense of what is right and wrong, uh, these are moral traditions. Ethics are sort of the science of how to apply morality within the world and how that shows up in public spaces. Um, so those moral traditions can hold you to a certain standard uh, and you may rise or fall depending on where, where you are on that threshold if you would say that you're immoral or moral. But what they can't do is in the, fr in the public frame, they can't describe what's necessarily appropriate or at a certain point what's legal uh, so our code of ethics and our ethical approaches within society tend to say, okay, you can go above this, but you can't go below this. And so, you know, if your moral tradition holds you above that standard, then you're fine. If it holds you below that standard, then we're, we're going to have issues. Uh, so, but that's where, you know, we do have compliance-based policies and we have laws and things like that where uh, there's a certain ethical threshold that you've got to meet in order to be a functioning member of society and citizen. Uh, that's how I would sort of. Good. Now that he's talked, it gave me a chance to think about an answer. So you talked about immoral people doing moral things. Is that? Is no, that? Immoral people doing ethical things. Doing ethical things. Yeah. So, so I, I, I got no problem cheating on my wife, but I wouldn't steal office supplies. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, oh, exactly. Because, uh, it, what you're doing is you're justifying immoral behavior, unethical behavior in one area and not in another. So I, I would say that I'm going to use two, <laughs> two examples. One is a, a good fruit normally bears good, a good tree normally bears good fruit, right? And a bad tree bears bad fruit. So, so what you're saying is, is one tree may bear good fruit and bad fruit is using, I think, a biblical uh, yes, kind yes. of, uh, thanks, Chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, by their fruits, you, you shall know them. I think eventually somebody that's, that's unethical or immoral is going to do something that's going to get them in trouble, either with the law or with their spouse or with, with uh, their job or, or whatever. So I, I, I think uh, you, you can't balance out good with bad. You can't say, okay, I can be an, an, an axe murderer here, but I can, mm -hmm. you know, run an orphanage here, and then it's going to balance out, and I'm going to be a, a, an average person. I don't think that works. I think one's going to outweigh the other no matter how much good you try to do. If this bad's just going to, going to uh, cause you to be a bad person. Now, now with that, I also think about the, the Minority Report. Are you familiar with that movie with Tom Cruise? You know, it, you can't convict somebody on, on crimes they haven't done yet. Even though they may be not a nice person, if they haven't done anything, you can't convict them on that yet. But normally, if they're bad people, it's just a matter of time before before something bad happens, they do something bad. Yes? What about, um, I guess I would call it moral dilemma or lesser of two evils. As a humanitarian aid worker, uh, you need to get into a blockaded area. Uh, children need powdered milk.
children don't get vitamin D, but will often get rickets. It's a medical fact. But you also can't transport anything into this blockaded territory because it could be used as explosive material for people that want to hurt a lot of our friends. Mm -hmm. So where, where, where are some solutions for that? I don't know if you say lesser of two evils or, or a moral dilemma. I don't know how you would characterize that. I, it is a moral dilemma, but I, I'm not sure. Go ahead, John. Well, and, sir, you mentioned, I mean, this idea that's now popular, the, the discipline disobedience, that, you know, there are times where we have to be intentional and say, you know, hey, look, I got it. We've got concerns with this area for this particular thing. But we're going to take drugs in, whether you try to stop us or not, you can arrest us. I'm also reminded of what the Italians were doing in the Mediterranean uh, with the Syrian refugee crisis, where the rest of Europe was very frustrated with how they were you know, rescuing people off the Mediterranean because it was creating a humanitarian crisis. But they had, uh, they had their values that said, we're not going to just let people die if we come across them. Uh, we're going to rescue them, and we're going to take them back to Europe. Uh, so there, there are issues, and at some point, I think that morally, ethically, we make decisions, and that's part of being an ethical person, is you make a decision. Uh, and then, you know, then we can judge that decision after the fact, uh, but... If we, if we just sit with this sort of nebulous, well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but if you make a decision, uh, the point is, is I, I don't think that lying to ourselves or lying to someone else is necessarily helpful. I think discipline, disobedience is okay with being in the daylight. Um, otherwise, I don't think it's, in many cases, discipline. Uh, I think that there are times where the, the gravity of the situation may demand that we do certain things in secret, particularly if we're running through a blockade, but that doesn't mean that we lie to everybody about what we're doing or why we're doing it. Um, so I think we've got to be upfront with ourselves and upfront with people who are potentially going to be involved with that. And if we're not okay with dying for it, that, that also gets into that moral ethical piece. Uh, if if I'm willing to sacrifice myself because I know that these children are going to starve, well, you know, I'm not doing this because I care about myself, you know. And so, so what are we, you know, what are we doing to communicate that and to also, you know, check our own political systems and the powers that be and how we're carrying out certain, certain tasks like a blockade because the point isn't to injure you know, defenseless women and children, men, women and children, because some men are defenseless, right? Uh, and so we're not there to hurt them, we're there to help them. And the blockade is there to help them, albeit to prevent them from doing certain things that harm people, right? I, you know, I, the dilemmas are dilemmas, it so it makes them hard to answer one way or another. But it, it, we teach to look at ethics through three different lenses, and so I, I think Whenever you have a dilemma, as long as you look at it through three different lenses of, of virtue, the virtue lens, the duty or principles, the ontological lens, and the consequences lens, and what are, what are the consequences of doing it. So if you look at it through the three different lenses of, of an ethical decision making, then, then I think you can hopefully come up with a better answer to the dilemma. Because if it's a dilemma, there is no right or wrong, right? That's the, the whole point behind the dilemma. So you've got to find out maybe which is more right and which is more wrong or the less right and less wrong, and, and try to make a decision from there. Yeah. All right, I think, uh, I think people are starting to, to wander in for the, the next 130 meeting. If, is there any last question before we, uh, we wrap this up? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Oh yeah, the, the three different lenses we look at, and these are actually in our, in our doctrine. It's the, the virtue lens, to, to look at virtues and what, what would a virtuous person do. Uh, to look at the, the duty or principles, so what, what's uh, laws or regulations or, or what am I supposed to do? And then consequences, what are the consequences of my actions, the consequentialism?
Thanks. So uh, with that, Rod, thank you for letting us have the opportunity to be here. I appreciate all of you showing up. I thank you. It's been a pleasure to, to be here with you. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Just a reminder, our next uh, brown bag will be 3 April with the Central Intelligence Agency. We hope to see you all here then. Thank you.